Gabrielle Marcel, the decline of wisdom, the limitations of industrial civilization. Industrial civilization, the meaning of the words seems obvious, but I think only because they evoke a set of images and ready-made ideas. The moment we say industrial civilization, we see factories, smoke, slums, suburbs, what have you, and all the commonplaces about mechanization spring into our minds. Mechanization means progress, or mechanization is a scourge, and so on. But none of it is enough to enable us to form even a preliminary concept. The trouble, as I have had occasion to say in a lecture I gave in Florence, is that the notion of civilization itself has its ambiguities, and the idea of industrial civilization, seemingly more exact, cannot help being affected by them. In principle, or rather at first, civilization meant the state of civilized man as against a state of being primitive, savagery, barbarism. That is an idea we already find in the philosophy of the Greeks, particularly of Aristotle, and which, after suffering a number of mishaps, reappeared in force in the humanism of the Renaissance. Perhaps we should note that its apparent obviousness and brilliance dimmed in proportion as the accent was placed upon original sin and its, to some extent, irreparable consequences. In the 18th century, however, at least in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's writings, it was confronted with a form of nature worship which pinpointed its corruption. While in the 19th century, on the contrary, the West, fascinated by the progress of science and techniques, seized on the idea of civilization as the reward of the fullest development of man's rational faculties. For positivism and all the schools of thought connected with it, civilization was the triumph of enlightened order over confusion violence and disorder. The optimists of a hundred years ago even thought of it as the means to universal peace, implying the gradual substitution of right for might and bringing with it not only generally increased well-being but as a corollary the harmonious development of the sciences and the arts. It would be difficult for us after the events of the past half century to share this optimism and in particular to see why man's growing mastery over nature should go hand in hand with the triumph of right. In any case, the development of historical science and sociology has, in the meantime, given rise to a very different conception. In place of the overall and in many ways confused notion of civilization as a whole, there has grown up the idea of civilizations which are not only distinct but altogether separate and irreducible to one another's terms. Civilizations which may coexist, though not without friction, but which are ever in danger of replacing one another in circumstances which are always tragic. It became more and more evident, especially in the light of ethnological discoveries, that those whom the civilized have presumptuously labeled savages had their own civilization with its perfectly recognizable structure and cohesion. It is tempting to say that in view of all this, there came about a dissociation between the ideas of civilization and value, which in the global concept had been inseparable. Actually, I do not believe that this can ever be absolute. It would be more true to say that with the development of a pluralist and historicist theory of civilizations, values came to be relativized, if I may be forgiven so barbarous a term. However you define it, a civilization implies beliefs, that is to say, values. What is dangerous is to assert a priori that these values are necessarily those which rationalist European thought, starting with the Greeks, has attempted to define as universals. 
Not that I would say that such a reduction is necessarily impossible, only that it would need the utmost caution. Can any of this help us to see a little further into what industrial civilization means? Obviously, it is quite different from a rural civilization, for example. We have only to think of England to see how these two sorts of civilization were able to coexist for a very long time, even in juxtaposition. Nor can it be said that their coexistence has now ended, though everything goes to show that industrial civilization is predominating, and this in circumstances which can easily be defined. What is also evident is that each of these civilizations forms around a particular way of life, and above all, that each of these ways of living belongs to its own particular environment. I have been greatly struck by what George Friedman has to say about what he calls the technical environment as against the natural environment. The technical environment. In the natural environment, man is present in his work. The span of work is as yet no bigger than that of man's natural movements and their technical capacity. The tools which Homo Faber uses in his natural environment may be complex, but their interposition between his hand or foot and the material on which he is at work does not mean that his part in production is eliminated. On the contrary, they humanize production further since they make it possible to manufacture something to which the craftsman, who completes the work himself, brings greater continuity and precision, carrying out his plan and giving it the harmony of a finished whole. In such a profession as medicine, this fullness of human presence is still noticeable. The natural environment, as such, is a climate of presence and sympathy. In it, a life rich in direct understanding and presence is combined with the spread of craftsmanship and the beginnings of industry. Nothing more different from this could be found than the technical environment, which as such is artificial and inhuman in the strongest sense, even where everything has been done to improve the material conditions of work. In this milieu, says George Friedman, boredom is the worker's mate. The only possible escape is on the side of man and George Naval, the author of Travaux and Parkour, who has been through this experience, writes, In the world of the factory, all that there remains of nature is man, the companion, the fellow being. If you were alone in it, you would die. No trees, no plants, no dogs. Everything you touch is hard, dense. Next to it, the soft stuff, of which your hand is made seems very fragile. In that fluid world of metal, it is reassuring to meet a comrade. George Friedman comments that so long as this world is still frequented by men, by comrades, there is a chance of conquering it, of molding it to the ends of culture and dignity. Nothing could be more true, I think, but we must still ask ourselves on what terms this comradeship can remain genuine. It stares us in the face that it is in grave danger of being impaired by the intrusion of politics, or, if you like, of propaganda. The moment men are brought in whose function is to pass on slogans, a milieu which was still living and charged with currents of friendship and even genuine brotherhood is in danger of being frozen, or to put it another way, of turning into a field with a transmission of quite different currents, which are inhuman and magnetized by the ends purely of domination. A question which arises here is whether people whose training has been almost exclusively technical are not much more susceptible to this kind of propaganda than those who have received what at the beginning of this century was still called a general culture. Not that I would suggest a return to the teaching of the classics as it was conceived at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries, but it seems that a counterweight to the growing technical trend in education needs to be invented. A strictly complementary aspect of industrial civilization 
is brought to light in this fine passage by Spengler, which occurs in the last chapter of his Decline of the West. Then followed the discovery of the steam engine. Till then, nature had rendered services, but now she was tied to the yoke as a slave, and her work was as though in contempt measured by a standard of horsepower. We advanced from the muscle force of the Negro, which was set to work in organized routines, to the organic reserves of the Earth's crust, where the life forces of millennia lay stored as coal. And today we cast our eyes on inorganic nature, where water forces are already being brought in to supplement coal. As the horse powers run to millions and milliards, the numbers of the population increase and increase on a scale that no other culture ever thought possible. This growth is a product of the machine, which insists on being used and directed. And to that end, centuples the forces of each individual. For the sake of the machine, human life becomes precious. Work becomes the great word of ethical thinking. In the 18th century, it loses its derogatory implication in all languages. The machine works and forces the man to cooperate. The entire culture reaches a degree of activity such that the earth trembles under it. And what now develops in the space of hardly a century is a drama of such greatness that the men of a future culture, with other souls and other passions, will hardly be able to resist the conviction that in those days nature herself was tottering. The politics stride over cities and peoples, even the economies, deeply as they bite into the destinies of the plant and animal worlds, merely touch the fringe of life and efface themselves. But this technique will leave traces of its heyday behind it when all else is lost and forgotten. For this Faustian passion has altered the face of the earth. This is the outward and upward straining life feeling, true descendant, therefore, of the Gothic, as expressed in Goethe's Faust monologue when the steam engine was yet young. The intoxicated soul wills to fly above space and time. An ineffable longing tempts man to indefinable horizons. He would free himself from the earth, rise into the infinite, leave the bonds of his body, and circle in the universe of space amongst the stars. That which the glowing and soaring inwardness of St. Bernard sought at the beginning, that which Grunewald and Rembrandt conceived in their backgrounds, and Beethoven, in the trans-earthly tones of his last quartets, comes back now in the intellectual intoxication of the inventions that crowd one upon another. Hence the fantastic traffic that crosses the continents in a few days, that puts itself across oceans in floating cities, that bores through mountains, rushes about in subterranean labyrinths, uses the steam engine, till its last possibilities have been exhausted, and then passes on to the gas engine, and finally raises itself above the roads and railways and flies in the air. Hence it is that the spoken word is sent in one moment over all the oceans. Hence comes the ambition to break all records and beat all dimensions, to build giant halls for giant machines, vast ships and bridge spans, buildings that deliriously scrape the clouds, fabulous forces pressed together to a focus to obey the hand of a child, stamping and quivering and droning works of steel and glass in which tiny man moves as unlimited monarch and, at the last, feels nature as beneath him.